Stay away from Amali's green beer. By Midland Amarindundit. I have a tradition on St. Patrick's Day. I do what most people do and visit the local Irish pub, sure. But my version is a little different. I don't go to drink and get hammered on Guinness and bottom shelf whiskey. No. I go to watch out for those who visit O'Malley's pub. Terence O'Malley has owned that beaten down bar on 5th Street for as long as anyone can remember. He's not an old man though, not by any means. It's more than the run-down building and dust-coated interior. Seems like it's been around for aeons. O'Malley's pub is the kind of place that you mostly forget about until someone brings it up. Then you seem to know everything about it. I've had a lot of blurry, formative memories at O'Malley's, but I overlook it most of the year all the same. It's the kind of place that when you walk in, you get this sense that you shouldn't be there. O'Malley's is dark and unwelcoming, with usually just Terence himself working behind the bar. If you happen to see another customer, it's one of the local bums nursing a beer and crying about the, his lot in life. Not that Terence gives a shite about anyone's problems. That perception of O'Malley's changes for everyone come St. Paddy's Day. It makes sense. Ours is not a big town, and when you're the only Irish pub around, well, people are going to remember you, and they're going to flood in. That bothers Terence. You see, even though his family has lived in the States for three generations now, he considers himself Irish first and foremost. It's his whole identity. <laughs> You can see why, then, he hates the fake-accented, begreened drunks who treat his place like an Irish-themed amusement park one day a year. That's why I go to O'Malley's pub every year to watch. Because sometimes, when the crowd gets a little too rowdy and the tone too dismissive, Terence brings out the green beer. I first witnessed it five years ago, I was a college student then, on an exchange programme, and just as dumb as every other kid who thought they understood what St. Paddy's Day was about. I was there with my friend Charlie and his girlfriend Lynette. To avoid being the third wheel, I also invited a guy named Shelby with us. I didn't know too much about Shelby, but I knew that he liked to party, and figured he'd be worth a laugh or two. We were several drinks in when Shelby started living up to his reputation. The man was absolutely smashed on bad whiskey and started loudly giving us an ill-informed rundown on recent Irish history. From the corner of my eye, I could see Terence O'Malley staring at Shelby from behind the bar. His look made my blood run cold. Aye, man, let's call it a night, huh? I said, clapping Shelby on the back. Like hell, dude. It's St. Paddy's. I'm going to stay out all night, frolicking like the wee ones, Shelby said, and laughed at his own bad accent. Things only got worse from there. Shelby continued to loudly opine on all things Irish, and before we knew what was happening, he was next to the table doing an approximation of river dance while singing a completely made-up ballad. All the while, Terence watched him. By this point, I was more embarrassed than anything. Charlie and Lynette exchanged glances, made an excuse about an early morning exam, and took off. It was just me and Shelby then. I was somewhat responsible for Shelby, since I was the one to invite him. I pulled him back down to the table. Everyone's staring, dude. Come on. Screw off, jerk. I'll uh, dance if I want to. I was about to get up and walk out myself, 
when Terence appeared at our table. He looked right at Shelby, but spoke to me. Your friend here thinks he's quite an expert, doesn't he? Has he never tried my green beer? Shelby cut in. I, I'll try your green beer, brother. He giggled again at his own bad accent. Terence grunted. That you will? It'll open your eyes right up. Something about Terence's tone of voice and expression made me uneasy. I watched as he disappeared into the back room. A full minute later, and he returned with a pint glass a liquid the colour of cloudy jade. He put it down in front of Shelby with a scowl. On the house, brother, said Terence, emphasising that last word sardonically. Everything about this situation felt wrong, but part of me felt like Shelby deserved what was coming to him. I figured that Terence had probably spit in it, or at least very worst, put a few ground-up laxatives in there. Turns out I'm not quite as creative as Terence. Shelby grinned ear to ear as he started to down the pint. The pale opaque liquid sloshed down his chin and onto his Kiss me, I'm Irish, t-shirt, but he seemed none the wiser. You'd better slow down a little, hey? I asked, feeling queasy at the sight of him. In response, Shelby belched and chugged the rest of the glass. He slammed it down on the table, where it shattered. Hey, quality stuff you've got over there, brother, he yelled over at Terence, who only gave an odd smile in return. All right, come on, let's get you a cab, I said, standing up to pull Shelby in his unsteady feet. He swayed against me, but didn't resist. We made it most of the way into the alley before he vomited. Green, frothy liquid poured from his mouth as he retched up what appeared to be gallons of food and drink. When he finished, Shelby wiped the back of his hand against his mouth and grinned at me. Let me tell you some... He stopped suddenly, his eyes growing white as he stared just above my right shoulder. Before I could even respond, Shelby began to frantically look around, spinning from one side to the other. No... No, 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 he shouted, his hands reaching up to grasp his face. He fell to his knees, soft whimpers coming from his vomit slick lips. Dude, come on, you're just drunk and sick. I'll get you home, and you can sleep it off. No, Shelby screamed, wailing up at the sky. Dude... Can't you see it? I can see it. I can see it all. What can you see? I asked, suddenly growing alarmed. Shelby was crying now, raking at his eyes with his fingernails. I can see everything. My God. His voice was a mix of awe and terror. I watched as his eyes bulged in fear as he held his head between his palms and wept. I moved towards Shelby, thinking that I'd at least help him to his feet. I'd never seen anything quite so drunk before, and it was making me uncomfortable. Before I could get to him, however, I heard a rattle behind me. Terence was standing at the back door of the pub, a curious smile on his watchful face. How's your friend there, eh? The know-it-all knows too much now, don't he? I opened my mouth to ask Terence what he'd done to Shelby's drink, but no sound came out. Or maybe it did, but was drowned out by Shelby's tears. I can't really remember. What I do remember... As I was looking at Terence, I heard a sickening pop. Another one followed, accompanied by the most feral scream I have ever heard. 
I never forgot either of those sounds. I turned back to Shelby and felt my knees give way. He had fallen to the ground. Blood streamed from where his eyes had been, while his blood-stained thumbs grasped and twitched at nothing. His eyes hung limply from their optic nerves, swaying with the convulsions of his body. I was the green bear, brother, Terence asked, shaking his head and smiling. He looked down at the blood pooling underneath Shelby for another minute before walking back inside a Mally's pub. Shelby's doctors said that there had been nothing wrong with his eyes. Physiologically, they were fine. I mean, yeah, they weren't in his head anymore, but all the systems were good. He just had some sort of psychotic episode, they said. Some sort of hallucination, coupled with the urge to self-arm. It was unfortunate, but not unheard of. Probably the result of alcohol poisoning and some pre-existing undiagnosed mental disorder. I didn't buy it. I went to visit Shelby in the hospital shortly after it happened. He was lying in bed, gauze wrapped around his eyes. I could just make out a dark indent in each socket through the translucent white fabric, and it made me go pale. I was happy that Shelby couldn't see my reaction. How are you doing? I asked tentatively. Shelby faced away from me and was quiet for a long time before finally answering. You were there, dude. You know what happened. Maybe. I don't know. Both of us were pretty drunk. I see it. I see it all. Life. What's underneath everything. Just below the surface, the surging infinite darkness. The insignificance. The nothing. And the everything. Yeah. I couldn't think of a response to that. And you know what the worst part is, dude? What's that? I can still see it all. Even with my eyes gone, I can see it all. He turned towards me and gave me what I supposed to be a rueful stare. I shuddered. I talked to the doctor before I left to find out what happened to Shelby. The doctor didn't know, had never even seen anything quite like it before. The blindness he could learn to deal with, the doctor said, but the hallucinations and delusions were proven to be resistant to treatment. As far as I know, Shelby has been in residential treatment facility these last five years. I imagine he'll be there until he dies. After what happened to Shelby's, I made it my mission to keep an eye out for anyone given a green bear at O'Malley's. Terence doesn't like it, but he doesn't say anything about it either. In fact, since the incident with Shelby, I've never spoken to him about it at all. He just watches me and glares. He knows I won't be around forever but there'll always be a never-ending stream of idiots who shows up to his pub on St. Patrick's Day. It might make him mad, but no one deserves what happened to Shelby, obnoxious drunk or no. That's why I go over to O'Malley's pub every year, why I watch and wait, and give the warning to those who are offered Terence O'Malley's green beer. St. Patrick's Day Stupidity by Cedar Cliff I'll preface this by saying I was really freaking stupid when this happened, for no good reason. So, if it seems like I'm being an idiot at any or many points, it's because I was. A couple of years ago, when I was the tender age of 20, I was getting dinner in my neighborhood when this random dude came up to me, introduced himself as Zack, and invited me to a St. Patrick's Day party 
at his place later that evening. He's kind of cute, he's with a friend, so he's marginally less sketchy than he would have been by himself, and I'm like, well, it's St. Patrick's Day, I don't have plans, and I can't buy liquor for myself yet. Sure, why not, let's party at this dude's house. I agreed to come by later, get my dinner and head home. Later came, and my roommates and I headed over to the place, which was just a couple of blocks away from ours. From the get-go, it was kind of weird. The house was really quiet, like you'd expect to hear a party, even from outside, but no, dead silent. I was like, well, maybe it's in the basement or something. A really well-insulated basement. So we knocked, and Zack answered the door. He looked kind of surprised to see us, actually, but he let us in. And no party. Just Zack and what looked like his roommate hanging out on the couch in their bare-ass living room watching TV. There were empty liquor bottles everywhere. At this point, I was a little peeved, and my roommate was very peeved, so we decided to hang tight for a minute and see what happened. We chatted with the dudes. Zack commented on my roommate's fingernails. Weird. And Zack's roommate didn't say anything. Weird. And eventually my roommate decided to leave. I was about to go with her when Zack invited me to do some spray painting with him in his basement. I'm an artsy type, and this sounded like a pretty cool time to me, so I decided to go for it. He encouraged me to do a shot, which I accepted, and grabbed me a beer, and for a while it was pretty fun actually. I spray painted a dragon on the wall, and he wrote, I heart you on another wall, weird, and tried to kiss me. I laughed him off without a kiss, and he went to get me a fresh beer. I was about done, but I had the second beer, and then went upstairs to head out. Zack insisted on one more shot. I wasn't feeling it, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. I'm a super lightweight, so at this point I was pretty messed up. I told him I should head out, but he started to usher me into his bedroom. I was still laughing, but underneath I was uncomfortable, looking for my purse, which I couldn't find in my drunkenness, but he was still pushing me into his room, toward his bed. I started to get scared. I insisted that I needed to find my purse. As I searched for it, pulling away from him when he tried to distract me from it, I could tell he was getting irritated and impatient. My urgency to find my things and leave went up a notch. I was hyper-conscious that I couldn't see his roommate or anyone else around me. After what felt like forever, I found it under a shirt deliberately hidden, maybe, and turned to go. By this point, I was very frightened. My heart was hammering, and I realized this guy got me all screwed up just to sleep with me, and I wanted to go. I told him I was leaving, and I headed for the door, which he was standing next to. He grabbed my arm. Now, he was a pretty big guy, and I'm a super tiny girl, but I reacted to it super fast and super negatively, and I don't think he was ready for it. I whipped around and snarled, Let go of my arm right now, jerk. And he did. He looked super startled, like I'd just socked him in the face or something. I booked it out of there, and didn't look back. I was shaking and practically scared sober. Here's the thing, though. 
I don't think this dude even knew that what he was doing was a kind of rape. I think he'd done this before, and that everyone else was just barely willing enough or too polite to react the way I did, immediately, loudly, and unequivocally. I think he let me go because he didn't think of himself as a rapist, and being treated like one kicked his feet out from under him enough for me to get away, which, frankly, is bloody terrifying in its own right. A few weeks later, I saw Zack on the street. Not unusual, we live in the same area, and he tried to talk to me. I put up a stop hand and breezed past him without a word. After that, I never saw him again. So, St. Patrick's Day would be rapist. Let's not meet ever. The Haunted Pub by Bog Monsters So thrilled to find a place on Reddit to share these experiences, without being shouted down by those who figure they know all the answers about the universe. Lots of stories, but some of the freakiest things that happened were during the time I managed an Irish pub, now closed, in St. Augustine, Florida. As many may know, St. Augustine is touted as the nation's oldest city, and although this is only semi-true, the place is ancient and absolutely loaded with unexplained phenomena. I moved there to open a pub for a man who I'd previously worked. Since the gig was meant to be temporary, I was given lodging in the Monson Motor Lodge, on which property the pub was located. Although my life has been filled with paranormal encounters and high strangeness, it never occurred to me that the place may be haunted. I went straight to work hiring and training staff, and worked seriously long hours. One night, after close, I sat at the bar with the bartender and a server, tossing down a pint or two of stout. The bartender was out of smokes, and out of luck, because neither the server nor I smoked. His last resort was a huge ashtray in the office that was full of butts. Finally, the bartender got that desperate, and announced that he was going to scavenge from the ashtray. The office was a small room at the back of the building, and had two doors. The first, which the bartender used, was accessible only through the kitchen to our right. The other door was at the far end of a large room directly in our line of sight as we sat at the bar. Seconds after the bartender had disappeared into the kitchen, he came bursting through the second office door in a panic. Where did she go? He shouted across the large room towards us. Who? we asked. The woman in the green dress. We started to wonder what was in his drink as he frantically ran around the pub looking for this woman. We had a clear shot towards the door, and assured him that he was the only one who had passed through it. Once we got him calmed down, he explained that as he stepped into the office and turned on the light, he saw a woman in a green dress with a large hoop skirt going through the other door. So certain was he of what he saw that he was too afraid to go back and complete his quest for cigarette butts. He made us go for the ashtray, so that he could calm his nerves. The next day, I relayed this experience to one of my servers, who said, You know this place is haunted, don't you? No, I hadn't even considered it. So she asked me, Have you ever gone into the bathroom and seen the paper towels unrolled? I said that I had seen this many times, and was often confused about who was doing it, since I always did a bathroom check at closing. Many times, I would go in and find a huge pile of paper towels leading from the dispenser into the trash can below. 
Well, it wasn't a human prankster. She went on to describe that she had done an opening check one morning, and when she entered the bathroom, not only was the pile of paper towels in the trash, but the lever of the dispenser was furiously going up and down, controlled by an unseen hand. There was another girl who refused to go into the bathroom alone, because she had heard the toilet paper dispenser in the other stall rattling loudly when she was the only one in the room. Although these incidents were curious and unsettling, the event that really terrified me took place in my hotel room. As a young woman living alone in a hotel, I was always a little uneasy about the usual things. One night, I had left the door cracked open so that my cat could get back in after his evening stroll. I was lying on the bed with no lights on except the telly, when the other side of the bed gave way to what felt like the weight of another human. Although the weight was greater than my cat, so great that I actually rolled towards the indentation. I naturally assumed that he had jumped up on the bed and made a mental note to cut down on his food portions. When I reached over to pet him though, he was not there. Finding this strange, I got up and turned on the light to see where he had gone. My cat was not in the room. I went back to the door and called out for him. He always came back running when I called, and this time he trotted back from the far side of the parking lot. It was physically impossible for him to have jumped onto the bed, back down again, and to have gone that far away in the time it took me to get back up and go to the door. This left me with visions of an intruder who must have broken in and must have hidden under my bed, waiting for me to come home. I finally got up enough nerve to look under the bed, only to find nothing. Realizing that I was sharing my room with an unseen tenant, I moved to the other bed and stayed up all night watching TV, too afraid to go to sleep. Needless to say, I moved out of that place as soon as I could.